think we're good. Well, good evening. Thank you guys so much for coming. I walk up here with a hymnal instead of a Bible. We're on, we're on track. <laughs> it's going to get good. Get ready. We're going to have a good time. So tonight we're going to talk about eight steps in a miracle. And the sun is bright, and I'm not used to this, but hey, we'll go with it. So I need this to be interactive because we need kids to help us out. The kids are in the service tonight. Kids are normally not in the service. We want the kids to have fun too. So while we talk, kids, can you all see me? If I put my hands up like this, I need all of you guys to say, are we there yet? We'll try it. I put my hands up. Are we there yet? Yes, and throughout the whole time, if all of a sudden my hands go up like this, I need you guys to say, Are we there yet? That's right, and that's going to help us keep track because whenever you go on a journey, our kids love to ask us when we're going to get there. And sometimes we're not even started on the journey, and the kids are asking us, when are we going to get there? So it's a process for us all to understand that life is a journey. And inside of life are a whole bunch more journeys. And we're looking for miracles and we're looking for things to happen, which brings me to the point of tonight. Tonight's topic is eight steps in a miracle. And these eight steps had to do with Mary and Mary's miracle. We're not gonna talk about Joseph's miracle because that may be for next year. But anyway, our step number one is that we mind our own business. If you look in the Bible from time and time again and throughout history, you'll always see somebody going along, minding their own business. They're doing their own thing, they seem like they're on track, life is going whatever, and all of a sudden, they get recruited. And the Bible's full of them. We see it with Moses, we saw it with Abraham, we see it with, with David, and we see it with Mary. Mary's going along, she's minding her own business, and all of a sudden, she gets encountered by an angel that starts to tell her about having a child, and that this child is going to be a special child, okay? Mary's probably wondering what was in her soup that night, a little concerned. If you think about it, wait a second. How many of us have ever had some sort of something in our mind, that, oh, we're going to try this? And we start to really think about it, and you're like, that's not rational at all. I'm absolutely not. Why would I try that? What, what, you know, you hear the little kids, when little kids are like, I'm going to grow up and be an astronaut. And people are like, well, I don't know. You know, you better stay in school a little bit longer. We start to, to put in the realities of it and almost kind of quench the vision that God puts in people's lives. And every one of us, I always say, have an individual purpose that God has called each one of us to. Each one of us has something that God wants us to do in our lives. And sometimes it kind of seems out there. And sometimes it seems pretty far-fetched. And so what we have is Mary starting out. This is in Luke chapter 1. Mary's starting out. She gets encountered by the angel. And the angel says, you're going to have a child. And he's going to be named Jesus. It's not until way later Joseph ends up having a dream. And gets told this is how what your child's name is going to be. You ever have something where two of you come together? And you haven't even been talking about it. it. just happened with Bree and I this week. We both had separate thoughts about something. We came together and we both started a discussion and we went, I had that too. I already knew that. Is that that's God. God ordained this. So God put this in Mary. The first beginning seed said, you're going to have a baby. And you know what? Mary did what most of us do. Yeah, <laughs> bless your heart, but I'm not sure if this is all real, and how do I know? And the truth is, we all do that. We kind of want a little, bit of, a little bit of something that tells us whether or not this is true. Something that kind of gives us a little bit more than just happenstance. And so, God says, hey, listen, you go visit your cousin, and uh, she's going to have a baby, Elizabeth. And uh, you'll see what's happening. Where they live, they live dis distance apart. So just so you guys remember, you kids in here, if you just remember this for a second, they didn't have telephones and they didn't have cars. So when people live like 10 miles away, like from car to Wellington, that was like a once a year visit. That's too far away. And so she didn't know. 
that her cousin was going to have a baby. She knew nothing about any of this. But that's okay. She went on this journey to be able to find out what was true. Oh, see, I'm checking. One more time, I can't hear you. No, but we'll be there soon. <laughs> so, continuing on. So Mary makes a journey to go see Elizabeth and, and learn about what is going on. And that's the step, number one. She minded her own business, but the step number two is now she needs to make sure she's not nuts. So the step number two in all of our journeys is we're making sure we're not nuts. And we all do that. There's some level of verification in this call. Am I losing it? Have I slipped a bearing? Because it can be fixed, but there's still time. I want to get it taken care of. The, so Mary goes over there, and she's heading out. She's going to do this. She goes and visits her cousin. And we get on to step number three, the commitment. But first, she has to make sure she's not nuts. So before she gets into the commitment, she's like, Elizabeth, you, I was told all of this sort of thing. And this is what's going on. And Zachariah can't talk at this point in time. Because, okay, backstory. You know guys how I do this. I always start to tell you about something, and then I didn't tell you what happened before that. So Elizabeth and Zachariah were getting up there in years. They couldn't have kids. And so they wanted to have kids. This was a big deal for them. And Zachariah kind of doubted it and so forth. Well, he ended up going into the temple. And when God told him that he was going to have a child, he kind of didn't believe that miracle happened either. And so he became mute. And he couldn't speak, and God told him he wouldn't be able to speak until his child was born. So this all comes about. So now Mary goes here. She sees Elizabeth. She sees that Zachariah can't talk. But Elizabeth doesn't know exactly why Zachariah can't talk because they're trying to talk, but there's a whole communication barrier now. And she begins to see a miracle that's happening. And she was told something that seemed impossible. I mean, think about it. Do you see somebody in their 50s having babies every day? It's not normal. And so can you imagine that Mary's getting told, hey, Mary, you're going to have a baby. And then also, just so you know, your cousin Elizabeth is already pregnant and she's going to have a baby, a baby. And I bet she's thinking she'd have a very higher chance. It, it's, what are the odds? Think about that for a second. I'm going to OK. And now she goes there and it's true. Do you think that changes a level of faith inside of her? We all start on our journey and we get to that making sure we're not nuts. And, and God provides some little signs that all of a sudden help us go, okay, I can buy this. And this, this makes sense. I think we're headed in a direction. Because if you think about it, an immaculate conception is pretty intense already. To imagine that that would happen. And then on top of it, that this was the son of God. I mean, you really think that that's legit? I mean, that doesn't happen every day. It had been prophesied for years, hundreds of years, and nothing had come about. So imagine getting to that point and going, I, 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 I just don't, I'm not seeing it. I don't quite get it. I don't quite understand it. And now she's, she's starting to see it. And then Mary, she puts it in her heart and says, all right, I get it. I, I commit to this. And she sings. She has a song about this. She recognizes, okay, there's going to be a baby. I'm going to do this. But then we get to step number four. Are Try that again. Are we there yet? No, but we will be. So bear with me. We're on to point number four. See, I'm very used to this. I've driven to Minnesota so many times. I think I have done it in my sleep. And I have been asked that many times. So moving on, we're on to step number four is training. See, when you get into a miracle and God's called you to do something, he doesn't just say, hey, go do this. He doesn't just leave you out there high and dry. There's a training ground. There's a training process. And you know what? Some of us are still in that process. Some of us have been enduring that for 10 years, 20 years. You know, Noah worked on that ark for, you know, almost 100 years. Quite, 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 a, quite a long time to be in the training ground. Do you think somewhere during that time he figured out, like, when he would be able to get all these animals? Like, seriously. I mean, we, it's pretty hard to conceive, but if you think about, if you were trying, okay, 
huh, I'm building an ark. Do you think over the course of 100 years, Noah was able to deduce that if he just brought on a full-grown elephant, it might be too difficult? <laughs> Do you think he was able to deduce if we take the lion clubs, they're nicer to us than taking a big giant lion? I know we all see the pictures of Noah's Ark and they've got all these big giant animals and they're like hanging out there. But if you really think about how you get all those animals on the Ark, they're, they're not so big. Now what he did bring was full-sized cows because they have something to eat and some radishes and sources. But they, they did do that. That was a process of training. It didn't happen overnight. David, he knew he was going to be a king. I tell you guys a lot of times. He ran for his life for how many years? How many years was he running from everybody else, especially Saul, who was after him, after him diligently to kill him? And yet, David continued to endure and endure. Or how about Moses? That Moses grew up in Egypt, and he's doing his thing in Egypt, and he's living life and so forth, and then he gets a little frustrated, he ends up having an altercation, he heads out into the wilderness... Heads out there for 40 years, minding his own business, expecting to be left alone. Do you think any of that was part of training ground? Do you think any of that was important when it was time for him to come back and get an audience with Pharaoh? Do you think he'd been trained? Do you think he knew how to get in the office? Many, many, many of us go through things and have issues in our lives that we have no idea is going to get us to the next step. He's going to take us in the direction that we're looking for. And, and it's, it's very surprising. Any of you ever get into something and you later go, now I know why I ended up doing that. You know, that paid off. My dad says things like that to me. We work on a project and he's like, see, I told you if you could learn how to run a drill, it'd pay off. Yes, dad, you're right, you know. See, I told you if you'd learn how to put a couple pipes together, you'd learn something. Uh, God, it pay, all these little processes that we have bring us to another level. But it's training. And so many of us think that that miracle is supposed to be tomorrow. We're supposed to have everything. Look at Mary. She just got told about a miracle and there's nine months of prep. Did you guys ever notice that? You know, babies take a while to come for a reason. It takes prep. And all these young parents, we always go, oh yeah, we got it all figured out. You know, we get the... Get the Get the little, uh, what do they call it, the nursery all set up. And we want this to look so, and everything. And, oh, we've got to have this. and Maybe get some outfits picked out. You put all this work into having a baby. And then by the time we got to number four, we're like, she's sleeping right there. We got this. <laughs> it's not that we didn't care. It's not that we didn't. What we were prepping for, we really had no idea. And sometimes, first time parents are thinking of all these other things. I love it. You hear them say, we're working on a birth plan. We did that. But we wrote out this birth plan. This is what we want. No medicine. We want to have it nice and uh, uh, nice and easy, natural birth. It's going to be beautiful, you know. And Lily was coming out. She was ready to go, man. And the doctor was kicking her shoes off trying to get ready to get this kid. It was no time. And the birth plan went its own way. Why am I saying that? Remember, the way we think it's going to go isn't God's way. We don't have the universe figured out. We don't know everything. We like to think we do. The scientists really work hard at working on that. But we don't quite get there. Are we ready? No. But we will be. Bear with me. So the point is, is that we have to have a level of training in our own lives to get ourselves to the place that we can take the next step. And step number five. After we go through training, guess what we get to have? Trials. And we have trials to make sure we were trained correctly. Because if you don't get trained correctly and you have a trial and then you're failing the trial, then you have to see step number four. Go back to training. You fix that and then you can go back to step number five and try the next trial. Now, some of us feel like all we ever do is endure the trials. But sooner or later, you're going to win them and you're going to get through them. But those trials get you ready for the miracle. See, every woman in here, I haven't experienced it, so I'm just speaking for the, the, the moms that have, have had a child. See, they experience something called baby movement. Children move around, okay? They like to kick the mom in the stomach right after she ate. 
throw a couple good ones. And the mom's like, oh, I just tell her. And, and the kid isn't even born yet. And the mom's already enduring a level of hardship. You watch that last few weeks before the baby's born. The moms love it. They're supposed to get a full night's sleep. They can't even sleep. They're exhausted. They're trying. They're moving around, tossing. All these different things happen. Because they're prepping. Because the kid's going to be up when they're born. You get prepped to be in tune to things. Come on, how many of you right now could be dead asleep and there's a certain noise you hear in your house and you're like, I'm ready to go. Let's go check that out. I need to go find out what's going on. We all have had it. I can hear water running like you can't imagine. I can hear it. I know it. I'm like, water, 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 water. I tell Bree, please don't put food in the crock pot at night because I can smell fire. And then I can't sleep all night long because all I smell is food. Oops. What's going on? You know, I'm heading up, checking out the kitchen, everything else. Okay, okay, we're going to be all right for the night. And I have to tell myself, okay, we're going to live. Nothing's on fire. Let's go back to bed. But I have that. But wait a second. You think Mary didn't have stuff on this journey? God sends her to Elizabeth. She gets to learn what childbirth is about and help. She gets to go help with this baby. She gets to start seeing some of this process six months before her child's going to be born. Isn't that interesting that God prepped her? Isn't that interesting? Because at the end of the day, Mary needed to be present for a delivery because she was going to do it herself. Well, with Joseph's house and help and maybe a camel. I don't know if any of the animals help. Are we there yet? Oh, see, we're not there yet, but I'm trying to get there. I'm trying. Bear with me. The point is, is we didn't know. Mary didn't know what was going to help her. She didn't know where things were at. So when you get to that place... You get some tests. So Mary's going through these tests, and now she's going to have additional tests because she's getting close to having the baby. She gets the test of finding out, hey, Joseph, so uh, I have something to share with you. Now, Joseph is like, is that a tumor? Would you like to like, let me in on the secret? I need to know what's going on. And it's one of those situations that I can't even imagine in that time the way people were treated and what she was having to endure just to tell her husband, hey, I'm having a baby. This was a stressful time. Now, on top of that, now they get to go out for a census because God has everything figured out. And this journey is going to bring Mary to a place that she's able to have a baby in a spot, no other spot on the planet, where there is going to be the greatest star shining for this child. No other star. You could go to this place over here, but it won't be anywhere else. How about, let's think about this. Let me help you out. So, we had an eclipse in the United States this last summer. And that eclipse happened. Any of you doubt that eclipse didn't happen? No, we all know it did. Scientists, the smarter people than me, said... This eclipse is going to happen, and there's going to be a funnel where this is going to be the best. People sold their house, their wives, their cars, whatever they had to get rid of to go to a spot in Wyoming for one day to experience the eclipse. I tried to see it from here. We got to see it through a special little box, you know, got to see a little bit of it. But you didn't experience the eclipse anywhere else as good as in that belt. So you have to understand that you've got a star shining in the sky and the most magnificent display this star is going to shine is in Bethlehem and nowhere else on the planet. And the scientists, these astrologers at the time, these three kings, they call them the wise men, they call them the magi, these dudes saw a star constellation forming and they said, we have got to get to that because under that is going to be the king of the Jews. That's where it's at. It's coming under those stars. That's a big deal. So they start following that on a journey that Mary had no idea was going on. Mary and Joseph are doing their own thing. Do you think the star was in the sky above them? We had hale Bop Comet a while back, just a few years ago. Maybe it was 20 years ago now. I can't remember. But we all could see it. Everybody could see it. This comet was in the sky. It was at first kind of cool. We all saw it a few times. And then it became, yeah, it's there. And we move on. 
Kind of like the mountains. We live along the mountains. They're pretty. We like to look at them, but we don't look at them like when somebody comes to visit and they're like, oh, look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We take it for granted. Do we not take it for granted? Well, Mary and Joseph, it's not like there wasn't a star constellation occurring above them. They're going, and on this journey, they're worrying about other issues. How many of us have the whole world's issues on our minds all the time? We're just trying to like keep the water running, keep the mortgage paid, keep the car, oil changed, keep the kids happy, keep the kids from being so happy so it's not so loud. We, we're trying to get everything that we can do to enjoy our lives. In the midst of our miracle, can you imagine? The Bible's very clear that Mary and Joseph were ordinary people. They weren't loaded. They didn't have all this money. They didn't have somebody to hire. Now, Joseph had a donkey, we would presume, and we, he's going along with the donkey and all this. But my guess is, I hope it was like pretty broke. We've got three donkeys at our house. Sometimes they're a bit of a challenge. They're fun. They're nice. They love to be pet. Limpy's the nicest. He limps for a reason. There's a long story. I won't go into that tonight. But it happens. These animals can be ornery sometimes. Can you imagine, honestly, guys... You sit, sit on a donkey, pregnant nine months, to go on a journey? Can you imagine? You guys realize that was like 90 miles? It's like from here to Denver, kind of quasi, about an hour drive. Some of you know it, you're guilty if you can do it in an hour. It's not an hour drive. <laughs> That's not an hour drive. If you're doing it in an hour, I uh, caught you. See, see if you guys are paying attention. Are we there yet? Not yet. Not yet. But we're almost. So the point is, is can you imagine a journey that far and you're going to do it on the back of a donkey? Or better yet, Joseph with his little flip-flops and he's trying to go clear across the earth. I mean, seriously, can you imagine how much fun that would be? Do you think that's not a trial? How would you like to be in Mary's shoes sitting there going, oh, we're going to have the Son of God. Do you think she just got up on the donkey? I just love it. Love and life. Let's go, Joseph. Let's have a good day. I don't see it. I don't see her sitting up there going, oh, I love this. This is a beautiful day. No. How many of you? We, we had a trip one time. We called it the trip from hell. It was horrible. Like everything under the sun was going wrong. It was like, ah. Oh. It was horrible. I can't imagine trying to make a three-day journey on the back of a donkey being pregnant nine months. We think about that. We, we well, yeah, it was a miracle birth. It was a, no, no, get that. Three days riding on the back of a donkey? Think she's going, ah, Braxton Hicks? Not sure. It might be Braxton Hicks. It might be real. I don't know what's going on. It's legit. I don't know. Joseph, like, you're all right. Just sit tight. How am I going to sit tight on the back of a donkey? I don't know if they argued. The Bible says they weren't perfect, though. They were the perfect parents. So if that's the case... I hope that they weren't frustrated with each other. But how many of us in our own situations, in our own lives? We're in the midst of our miracles, guys. And things are driving us crazy. We're frustrated. We're challenged because we're going through the trials. The trials are there for us. I absolutely believe with all my heart, Mary is hanging on. They're not wealthy. They're poor people. And now they get to... The arrival. They get to the destination. Bethlehem. Just like sit tight, babe. You sit right there. I'm going to go in, use my American Express. I'll get us anything. No, that's not what happens. That's what we... Now, hey, listen. In America, is it not true that some people have more prestige? They have rooms reserved. I work in a city where there's rooms reserved and they kick people. No, nope, can't give you a room. Can't give you a room. Waiting on the rich guy to show up. I've seen it. If you pay $300 for a room, you get a lot better business than you do for $50 for a room. Now think about that. Joseph and Mary didn't have the means. They didn't have all this money. Are we there yet? No, but Joseph and Mary finally got there. Now we're getting there. Just bear with me a second. So the point is, is so they're looking. They're looking at this. They're saying, oh, okay. Um. Can we get something? And they're like, no. So Joseph comes back out. He's like, good news, honey. These guys are like rat infested. We're going to check out another place. So they go to another place. And pretty soon, the other place, the other place. Mary's exhausted. Three days. Three days. Can you imagine? 
You ever seen transitional labor, some of the moms in here? Can you imagine if she was going through that on the, in the midst of riding on the back of a donkey? There's a lot going on. And now they finally, finally find a guy that says, no, but, you know, I, I just don't have anything. And Joseph's like, listen, I'm going to be sleeping in a chicken coop here pretty quick because she's getting kind of feisty. We've got to find a place for her. Okay, she's upset, she's going to have a baby, and she's starting to cry. Can you please help? I don't know if that really happened, but I can imagine his stress. I can imagine the stress of saying, we really need to kind of get something figured out right fast and in a hurry, because this is getting frustrating. And the guy's like, don't stay in a chicken coop, you can have my barn. And you both can sleep in it. All right, yeah, that, that'll work, I'll take it. So then Joseph and Mary go into a barn. And that takes us to step number six. And that's the miracle. Notice that the miracle didn't come in step one, two, three, four, or five. It wasn't until you get to step six. And think about this, because I said there's eight steps in a miracle. We're getting close, kids. We're getting close. The point is, is at step six, the miracle happens. She delivers a baby through the training, the trials, everything that she has had to endure. She has a baby in a barn. I'm telling you, I know the majority of you ladies in this room, I'm telling you right now, I know that you guys are all adaptable. I've seen you adapt to so many circumstances in our church. I think you guys are awesome, and I bet none of you would have been bothered with having a baby in the barn either. So think about that with Mary. It was a great, nice, quiet, clean environment. Not much to have to worry about with the animals and everything else. And the miracle comes in an environment that you didn't expect. How many of you ever had a miracle that you didn't even realize was your miracle? How many of you didn't even realize it was time to have the experience? And it was completely shocking how it came in the first place. Our miracles don't come the way we always expect them to come. It's not what we always expect to see. It's different. And so we have to ride with that a little bit and understand that it's going to be different. And there are different scenarios behind it. But it's a miracle just the same. So you think about it. We've got a baby. It's born. They put it in a food trough. But they call it a manger. How many of you even call your food troughs mangers anymore? We don't call them them food troughs. But the point is, is they put it there so it had a little crib, probably to protect it so Mary could like get two minutes of shut-eye. I get it, but it fulfilled the prophecy. And there's a star above them that they have no idea even is there. And that's, that's the step seven, the unknowns. See, in step seven, we are so worried about us. We are so focused on tunnel vision that we have no idea everything else that's going on around us. We're all here in church right now. I have no idea what's happening in Denver. No idea. Because I'm here. Does that mean that God's not working in Denver? Does that mean God's not doing something in Denver? I have no idea. But knowing our God, I'll bet he's doing something. The point is, is there's unknowns. God got it started. See, when Mary and Joseph are having this baby, angels appear to shepherds out in the field, and they go, hey, check this out. The Christ child was just born in town. You have nothing better to do tonight. Why don't you go check it out? They're like, sweet, we want to go see this. There's a huge celebration going on out in the fields. They're like, this must be a big deal. I have got to see this. That's what my Aunt Myrna did when we first moved into our house in Sterling. She was like, I have got to see this. She came in and just started walking through the house. (laughs) She wanted to see it. Hey, you know, we were like, well, what what are we doing? She just wanted to see our house. Can you imagine being that shepherd? Don't confuse the shepherds with the wise men. Two different. We see the nativity scene. But the shepherds are different than the wise men. The shepherds are out taking care of their animals. Angels appear to them. The wise men saw a star. Get that, guys? Following me? All right. Are we there yet? No, no. But we're almost there. Mom and Dad, hang on. We're getting close. All right? So the point is, is so the shepherds get told by the angels, and God had that going in the background. And then there was a star. Everybody saw the star, this constellation. Okay, whatever. But guys, do you realize the scientists have been able to trace this back? I want you to hear this. 
There were two star conjunctions. Go home and Google this. Conjunctions. All the kids need to say conjunctions. That's because moms and dads will remember, won't remember that word tonight, but the kids will. And so there are two conjunctions. Venus and Jupiter on June 17th of 2 BC that came together. And that was what the wise men started to follow. They said something significant is below those stars. And they started following it. They followed that for 70 days. 70 days that went on. And then guess what? On August 25th, 26th, scientists can't quite tell exactly. But in those two days, roughly, in 2 BC, there was a six-fold conjunction. Six-fold conjunction. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, the sun and the moon aligned. 93%. You could go to the University of Colorado in Boulder at the planetarium and look up the Star of Bethlehem and check it out. Am I making this up? We know in the Bible it says there's a star. We know in the science world there was a big system happening that they saw. And they followed that. Mary and Joseph had no idea. Mary and Joseph were like, check this out. I think that star is following us. Did you notice that? <laughs> She's like, get the donkey there. Could you quit looking around and watch the road? That's what they do. She's getting frustrated. But guys, it happened. It happened all around them. Whether we think it's happening or not, whether we realize that God's at work around us, Everything's happening around us. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. So then it goes on. They go to Jerusalem. Okay, fact check. Jesus, born in Bethlehem. Jesus came from Nazareth. Three wise men, Jerusalem. Three different cities. Got that? They go to Jerusalem. They're like, check out what is happening over Bethlehem, Herod. We want to know because that's the king of the Jews. Herod went, um... Um, hold on. <laughs> I, I'm the king. I'm the king. So whoever this dude is, we need to rub him out. Kids, your mom and dad will explain that later. The frustrating thing is, is he's upset and he's after that baby. So Herod sends people to Bethlehem. That baby's already been born. The wise men continue to follow the stars. Well, have you guys ever noticed that our... Earth goes like around and around the mulberry bush a hundred million times fast, okay? The stars begin to move apart, just like the solar system works. And what did the three wise men do? <laughs> Guys, I want you to look this up. It's so important to understand. It's really explained in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 2, 2, right? Hold on, I got to look at my notes. I forgot. Yes, Matthew 2. In Matthew chapter 2, the wise men didn't go when the baby was born. They started following the stars, and you'll see that it says they went to the house of Mary and Joseph. So we know they'd already gotten back. They followed this back and actually went to Nazareth, where they gave the gifts. Are we there yet? No, guys. We're not there yet, but so close I can taste it. So the three wise men get there. It's happening in the background. The three wise men get there. And they bring gifts. Everybody's like, Dad, they brought gifts. That's why we give gifts at Christmas. Yeah, well, it's kind of like that. But you know what those gifts were for? For the blessing and the anointing on that child. Because everybody forgets, and what we don't talk about is, Herod was ready to go kill that baby. Do you think after they figured out that they blanked in Bethlehem, they weren't headed to Nazareth? They already had a census. And so God appeared to Joseph through a dream, it was actually the angel Gabriel, and told him, you need to flee to Egypt. How do you think he had the money to do it? All the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, that's, that's all special properties and value so they could raise the Christ child. See, God works a miracle that you don't even understand. You're like, thank you for this gift, and you have no idea. Everybody's in the midst of a miracle in their life. I believe it with all my heart. We always have different things that are happening to us. And different things happen for a reason. And we don't always understand them. But it's perfectly important to look back later. And you will realize some of the things and why they happen. And how they happen for a reason. It's important to understand that God has his eye on every one of us. 
And that brings us to step number eight. Are we there yet? No, but we are almost there yet. So listen, in step number eight, you want to pass it on. The Bible's so clear about the miracles that we have in our life, so clear about what God does for us, and he's, God is always looking to be glorified. God is always looking to be magnified. You have to pass it on. And you need to realize you're in the midst of your miracle. Share that with others. This is what I'm doing. This is what God has called me to do. You know why? Because God sends all of us, just like he sent the three wise men, to hand the money to Jesus' parents. Sometimes all of us help each other out. Maybe it's information we know. Maybe we have time that we can spare. But we all help each other out with our own miracles. And the miracle is here because he came. We don't always understand everything that's going on. But understand this. It's coming. Say to yourself, it's coming. It's coming. Recognize that the Lord is working in your life and it's coming. Now I have a word to speak over you guys. Please stand with me. Lord Jesus, our Father and the Father of all, God, I just ask you to bless everybody here and everybody watching, Father God. Hold them so close. Protect our minds, Lord. Don't let us doubt. Don't let us sway. Remind us of your unfailing hand, Lord. As we work towards your anointed goal, Father, we ask you to pour your favor on us. Saturate us in your presence. Remind us of your daily miracles. Strengthen us, Lord, when we're weak. Give us your grace. Surround us with amazing love. I pray for divine approval over everybody. I pray for open paths. May everybody be filled with fruit, the bread of life. Father God, help them to stand confidently to persevere in all trials and tribulations. Bless their Christmas. Father, bless their Christmas. Lastly, tune them into your still, small voice. Fill them with your perfect peace today and forever. In the name above every name, the name that commands every knee to bow, the name of Jesus. Amen. Guys, please sing Silent Night with us. What page is that on? Does somebody know? Thank you. We almost have it. Hey guys, watch your hair, please. We, we want to make sure everybody's hair makes it out of here.
Well, God bless your Christmas. Thank you so much for joining us. And we just pray you have a great time with all your friends and family.